The United States of America is a nation renowned for its ideals of freedom, equality, and opportunity. In the War of Independence, the United States claimed to be the land of the free and the home of the brave. Words that spark revolution and look great on paper, but in reality, freedom is different for everyone, especially if you're black. The U.S., often seen as a land of freedom and opportunity, has a complicated history when it comes to racial equality. Black Americans have played a significant role in shaping the nation's culture and society, but they've also endured centuries of hardship and inequality. From the dark period of enslavement, spanning nearly two and a half centuries, when millions of Africans were forcibly brought to American shores, to the monumental moment of emancipation following the Civil War, the journey of black Americans has been marked by unwavering resilience in the face of unimaginable adversity. The struggle for civil rights, epitomized by the historic achievements of the civil rights movement and the acts of Martin Luther King Jr., showcased the indomitable spirit of black individuals and their enduring commitment to achieving equality. However, the stark reality remains that black Americans are fitted to a status of second-class citizenship, subjecting them to violence, discrimination, disenfranchisement, and deep-rooted social and economic disparities. In this video, we share the real experience of what it is to live in the land of the free as a black individual. Also, as a way of supporting our efforts, hit the like button of the video, share, and subscribe to help the channel grow. Your support means a lot to us. In 2021, South Carolina Republican Senator Tim Scott shocked many people when, in response to President Joe Biden's congressional address, he stated that America is not a racist country. He admitted that he himself had experienced the pain of discrimination and noted, I know what it feels like to be pulled over for no reason, to be followed around a store while I'm shopping. When asked on ABC's Good Morning America the following day, Vice President Kamala Harris seemed to agree with Scott when she said, I don't think America is a racist country. Yet immediately following this sentence, she quickly pointed out, but we also do have to speak truth about the history of racism in our country and its existence today. When a person critiques America for the racism that is deeply embedded in our social institutions, some feel they are being personally attacked. This is because deep down, they realize that they benefit from unearned assets associated with whiteness. Scott, Harris, and Biden recognize this and try to balance these varying perspectives as they worry about voters nationally and in a state like South Carolina. The politics of racism in the United States persistently cast a shadow over the stark and often challenging reality faced by black people in the country. While progress has undoubtedly been made in the fight for racial equality, the deeply ingrained structures of racism continue to shape the experiences and opportunities of black individuals, particularly black men. Despite strides towards civil rights and the dismantling of overtly racist laws, Systemic racism persists within American society, perpetuating a cycle of inequality and injustice. Studies on what predicts who believes they are middle class have shown the depths of racism. For education, income, and occupational prestige, black people are less likely to identify as middle class compared to whites with comparable levels of these socioeconomic outcomes. Why? It is because social class is not just about what a person looks like on paper, but how people experience social class in everyday life and the deference that one receives for their socioeconomic status. Black people are less likely to get that deference, while white people are often afforded more. It is so commonplace for white people that some cannot fathom living without it. This is because many white people particularly white people with lower levels of education and income, realize that whiteness comes with a premium that extends beyond economics to include cultural and social capital. As President Lyndon Johnson said, 
If you can convince the lowest white man he's better than the best colored man, he won't notice you're picking his pocket. Hell, give him somebody to look down on and he'll empty his pockets for you. Politicians like Harris and Scott's comments are puzzling at a broader level as well, considering how much of a collective memory their experiences with racism are. Harris reliving her systemic experiences with busing and Scott recounting the nearly 20 times he has been pulled over by police, where being an elected official potentially made the interaction worse. These stories acknowledge that life is different if you are black, and unfortunately, systemic racism seems to ripple through our social institutions and into our daily social interactions, whether in Congress or at a coffee shop down the street from the Capitol. These types of experiences, racialized cuts and hurdles have a cumulative effect on health. Sociologists Pam Jackson and Jason Cummings research documents that middle-class blacks have worse health profiles than working-class whites. They attribute this difference to the daily racialized trauma experienced in predominantly white environments like work and neighborhood settings. Systemically, we know that black people compared to whites are more likely to attend schools with less funding per student, less likely to obtain a job because of our black-sounding name or even when attending an Ivy League university, less likely to obtain a home loan, even when having the same credit score, have their homes appraised for equitable value, more likely to experience pregnancy complications and maternal mortality, and more likely to have contact with police and the criminal justice system. This isn't just speculation. In the case of getting jobs as a black person, there have been studies to prove that black people are racially vetted. To test whether employers might discriminate against job applicants with black sounding names, associate professors of economics, Marianne Bertrand with Chicago's Graduate School of Business and Sendil Molinathan with MIT conducted an elaborate experiment. They fabricated resumes for multiple phantom job seekers with common black and white names. The professors then sent out nearly 5,000 resumes for 1-300 job openings advertised in newspapers and on online job sites throughout Chicago and Boston. Most job openings for which the researchers sent resumes were administrative, sales, clerical, and managerial positions. Bertrand and Mullane Nathan randomly assigned the applicants' names common to either black men, black women, white men, or white women and were careful not to send identical resumes to the same employer. Bertrand and Molanathan then tracked which of their applicants were called for job interviews. Bertrand said that more resumes were sent to Chicago area employers simply because it is the larger metropolitan area, but added that the rate for interview requests was virtually identical between the two cities. The results were a bit disturbing. Applicants with white-sounding names were 50% more likely to be contacted for job interviews than those with typical black names. There were no significant differences between the rates at which men and women were contacted. The results indicate large racial differences in callback rates to a phone line with a voicemail box attached and a message recorded by someone of the appropriate race and gender. Job applicants with white names needed to send about 10 resumes to get one callback. Those with African-American names needed to send around 15 resumes to get one callback. This would suggest either employer prejudice or employer perception that race signals lower productivity. While this study was done in 2003, new research find that employers aren't treating identical resumes equally and job applicants with black names still less likely to get interviews. In 2021, researchers from the University of California, Berkeley, and the University of Chicago sent 83,000 fictitious applications for entry-level job postings to 108 Fortune 500 employers using randomly assigned and racially distinctive names. They found that Applicants with black names were called back 10% fewer times across the board 
and even less when it came to specific companies, despite having comparable applications to their white counterparts. It's not just getting a job that is difficult. Climbing up the corporate ladder is near impossible for black people. White employees often have a higher likelihood of receiving promotions and being considered for leadership roles within organizations. Being qualified for a job in the first place is also a hurdle. Black people do not get the best when it comes to education. Unequal access to quality education due to chronic underfunding is a stark reality for many black students in the United States. And numerous real-life instances illustrate the depth of this problem. In many cases, schools in predominantly black communities receive significantly less funding than schools in predominantly white areas. This funding gap can result in a lack of essential resources. For instance, schools in low-income neighborhoods may struggle to provide up-to-date textbooks, educational technology, or extracurricular programs that are commonplace in wealthier school districts. The disparities in school infrastructure are palpable. In some predominantly black communities, students attend schools with deteriorating buildings, outdated facilities, and inadequate heating or cooling systems. For example, in Detroit, Michigan, students have attended schools with crumbling walls, leaking roofs, and classrooms without proper ventilation. In some instances, underfunded schools in black communities face closure due to budget constraints or low performance. When these schools close, students are often forced to commute long distances to access education, disrupting their learning and daily routines. It's just not being able to attend quality schools, but the tests are also a trap for black student. Standardized tests can be culturally biased, disadvantaging black students who may not have access to test preparation resources. In the US, standardized tests like the SAT and ACT have been criticized for perpetuating racial disparities in college admissions, as they may not accurately reflect the potential of black students. Despite the criticisms, nothing has been done and the disparities still remain. Systemic racism inhibits, rather than prohibits like in the past, people's ability to actualize all aspects of the American dream. This occurs even for highly educated black people with high incomes and no criminal record. In fact, research documents that white people with a criminal record are more likely to get called back for a job than black people without one. Research documents that hard work or lack thereof, intellect or criminality, do not explain these outcomes. Instead, it is the racism embedded deeply within our social institutions' policies, rules, regulations, and laws that segment people's experiences along racial lines. It is the same for gender. Women can achieve but have a much harder time doing so. If not, America would have had a woman vice president and speaker of the house sitting behind the president long before 2021. What people do not seem to realize is that being upwardly mobile does not negate encountering racist hurdles on the pathway to success. Our current system is set up for some people to have to jump over hurdles to succeed while others get to simply run to the finish line without those same racial hurdles. Rather, it is about whether the pathways to success are equitable. This is what America says it is, an equitable democracy. People are pushing for America to reach its true ideals, and the only way this can properly occur is acknowledging the systemic barriers that prevent us from getting there. Moreover, it is not that racial progress has not been made. It is that the United States has yet to make enough progress. In this regard, comments of top elected officials are disappointing yet predictable. Black people who succeed often walk on pins and needles because they realize that their success, and more so maintaining it, is precarious. As a result, some black people aim to make white people feel comfortable. Many of us are mostly socialized to do so. It is often a survival strategy for our lives during police encounters or economic survival in boardrooms. 
Some of us who succeed may experience survivor's remorse because we are some of the few to make it. We actually embody the American dream and become the in-person example to people who do not want to admit that systemic racism exists. We may even convince ourselves that racism is more prominent on the individual level than the institutional level. We simultaneously represent racial progress, but are also most likely to be subjugated to racial discrimination because of the predominantly white spaces we are embedded within. We experience a chronic form of double consciousness, and admitting as such can often lead us to being conscious of the slow death we often experience through the cumulative racist cuts and hurdles we encounter. The American Dream Being achievable for a few does not absolve the system and an imperfect union, even when some of those successful people try to rationalize systemic racism away. In most instances, when black parents worry about their straight-A students' traffic encounters with the police more than they do a potential accident, this is because of experiences with racism. It is well known that black people are more likely to experience racial profiling and confrontations with law enforcement, sometimes resulting in tragic instances of police violence. The fear and anxiety associated with these encounters can have a profound psychological toll. When a black couple is about to have a baby and has to think consciously about what hospital to deliver in so they can obtain equitable care, this is racism. Once again, we know that black women in the United States face alarming disparities when it comes to maternal mortality rates making them more likely to die during childbirth or due to postpartum issues compared to their white counterparts. This disturbing trend highlights the complex intersection of racial disparities, healthcare inequalities, and systemic biases within the healthcare system. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, black women are three to four times more likely to die from pregnancy-related complications. Several factors contribute to the heightened risk of maternal mortality among black women. One key factor is systemic racism within the healthcare system. Studies have shown that black women are often subject to bias, discrimination, and stereotypes when seeking healthcare, which can lead to delayed or inadequate medical attention. Other aspects of racism are when a black parent worries about their child attending a prestigious university outside of an urban area. This is often because of the racism they worry about them encountering driving to the school and even once physically on the campus of the school. And even more urban universities are not absolved from racism, throwing another wrench into the belief that higher education is the great equalizer. A new paper suggests that African-American graduates from elite institutions do only as well in getting jobs as white candidates from less selective institutions. The study, published in the journal Social Forces, shows that while a degree from an elite university improves all applicants' chances at finding a well-paid job, the ease with which those jobs are obtained is not equal for black and white students, even when they both graduate from an institution such as Harvard University. A white candidate with a degree from a highly selective university, the paper suggests, receives an employer response for every six resumes he or she submits. A black candidate receives a response for every eight. White candidates with degrees from less selective universities can expect to get a response every nine resumes while equally qualified black candidates need to submit 15. The researcher Gaddis gave the candidates names that were likely to signal to potential employers what their races were. Black male applicants were named Jalen, Lamar, and Daquan. Black female applicants were named Nia, Ebony, and Shanice. White male applicants were named Caleb, Charlie, and Ronnie and white female applicants were named Aubrey, Erica, and Leslie. White job applicants with a degree from an elite university had the highest response rate at 18%. Black candidates with a degree from an elite university had a response rate of 13%, with white candidates holding a degree from a less selective university following closely at nearly 12%. 
black applicants with a degree from a less selective institution had a response rate of less than 7%. Black graduates at elite colleges not only had a response rate similar to that of white graduates from less selective institutions, but the employers who responded to black applicants were often offering jobs with less prestige and with salaries that trailed those of white candidates by an average of $3,000. Education apparently has its limits, because even a Harvard degree cannot make Daquan as enticing as Charlie to employers, Gaddis wrote. While the experiment could not measure the odds of applicants landing a job after getting an initial response, Gaddis said, gaps this large at just the first step of the process demonstrate that a bachelor's degree, even one from an elite institution, cannot fully counteract the importance of race in the labor market. How welcoming a company is to diverse applicants once they meet and interview them means little if they can't even get in the front door. All these facts prove that systemic racism is not simply a thing of the past. It is up close and personal in the present. Racism may be no more transparent in an institution with the least representative racial progress like the Senate. There have only been 11 black senators in roughly 232 years. Clearly, the Senate is the exact space we need, people with the courage to say the blunt, honest truth about our nation's past and present. Only then can we actualize a future where systemic racism does not exist. It is imperative for a truth reconciliation, and reparative process to commence. This starts with atoning for the enslavement of millions of Africans whose descendants continuously fall systemically behind. Investment in education and job training programs can provide equal opportunities, particularly in historically disadvantaged communities. Allyship and solidarity are vital as is amplifying the voices of black individuals and organizations leading the fight against racism. Legal reforms and legislative action are needed to bring about systemic change. Additionally, a cultural shift is required where diversity, equity, and inclusion are valued and celebrated in media and everyday life. Addressing systemic racism is an ongoing process that demands commitment from individuals, communities, institutions, and governments. Recognizing the deep-seated nature of racism in American society and dismantling discriminatory systems and practices are central to fostering a more just and equitable society for all. This brings us to the end of this video. Tell us what you think in the comments section, as we are always interested in your thoughts. As always, don't forget to like the video subscribe to our channel, and share our videos to let more people know the truth about blacks and to hear their own part of the narratives. Thanks for watching.